Ladies and gentlemen, Side Strafe back with another episode of the Strafing Run. And as always, it has been a while since I've cooked up one of these, but I thought it high time as I've got quite a few things to discuss, especially considering that I just saw the movie Dunkirk. And so I thought it appropriate to include some DCS World 2.0 featuring my Supermarine Spitfire LF Mark IX. Granted, not the same spit from the film, nor one that was involved in Dunkirk, but uh, hey, it was uh, the closest thing that I could get a hold of. And uh, if anything, I can tell you right now that uh, it's really cool to be able to make the comparison between what you're seeing in the film and here with the uh, instrumentation, the gauges and whatnot, to be able to recognize things and to even in some ways know exactly what they're doing in the movie because of playing DCS, which simulates the real deal as best as you can. Now, I'll talk about the movie a little bit just from the perspective of a, a movie goer, somebody that likes films and not necessarily somebody that wants to nitpick historical accuracy. And uh, I think for somebody that just enjoys movies, one, it's an excellent film. You should go see it just for that reason alone. Christopher Nolan nails it just as he has done with his previous films. It's a great movie. The cinematography, uh, the fact that 75% of the film is shot in 70 millimeter, which means it's built for IMAX theaters. So, you know, that's the first thing. If you're going to see it and you have access to IMAX, go see it in IMAX because when the shots fill the screen and you're seeing the dog fights and the beaches and everything in 70 mil oh it's absolutely stunning unbelievable it's the first time I think in movie history that we've had that much 70 millimeter in a movie usually you just get bits and pieces edited together with the uh, the, the rest of the shots and uh, when you see this fill up your entire screen it's just jaw-droppingly gorgeous especially if you're um, a World War II air combat uh, enthusiast you will be blown away by some of the scenes um, as far as the combat itself I'm not necessarily a, a flight expert most of my expertise comes into play when we're discussing World War II uh, infantry and armor tactics and, and fighting um, but from what I witnessed of the film I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. It looked very legitimate and accurate to what um, we've seen in, in gun cam footage and what we might see if we had, you know, GoPros in, in these machines. Uh, it, it felt real. It felt intense. And everything mixing together with audio and, and video to create this cinematic masterpiece. I might be over hyping it at this point I apologize I'm just kind of fresh out of it so I'm still kind of excited um, we could take a look at another World War II film of recent times Fury and think about how in one respect it was fun to see real Sherman tanks and uh, a real tiger uh, rolling around and shooting at things you know it had some good audio it had some good moments it showcased the horrors of war but it failed in many respects when concerning uh, tactics and common sense procedures especially towards the end uh, there was a lot of luck happening in that film as well do I hate the movie no but is it gonna go down in history as a historical piece definitely not um, Dunkirk, I don't think, makes the Fury mistakes. I would say that this film is far more legitimate than, than Fury could ever be. Um, and again, you can appreciate them as different things as a moviegoer, and that's fine. Uh, often, ignorance is bliss, and if you know too much going into a film or even a video game, sometimes you're just setting yourself up for disappointment. But with Dunkirk, I think... It's going to make moviegoers and uh, history buffs alike very happy. Um, beyond that, did I talk about the audio yet? I know I talked about the cinematography and just how great everything looked in a combination with the sound, but 
The sound, holy smokes, even at the very beginning, the first few minutes, you're jumping out of your seat. Make sure you get into a theater that has some great speakers, some good audio. Please see it in IMAX, but if you can't see it in IMAX, make sure the theater is well equipped for audio because the Stuka sirens, oh my goodness, you will never hear a more terrifying sound in your entire life. Bar none, some of the best sound design ever for these machines. Um, and not just that, but the planes in general. Our theater was so loud, plane would fly over in the movie, and it might as you might as well have been at an air show. You might as well have been in there. The, the seats were shaking, I kid you not. The audio was fantastic at my theater. So if you can, spend the additional to, to get into IMAX. Um, I know it varies depending on where you live. Uh, thankfully, the movie's not 3D, so it's not going to have that overhead on it. Um, I was lucky enough for the ticket to only cost me 10 bucks. That's pretty good for an IMAX film, especially of this quality. But just everything going in, there wasn't a lot of CG. If there was, I didn't notice it. It was very basic stuff, I think, with some of the... Uh, the shots that included ships and things like that, maybe. But I think a lot of the air combat was filmed with real planes and maybe a mixture of remote control, like big-ass remote control planes uh, for some of the shots, especially where there's maybe damage taken and whatnot. Um, and yes, in, in some cases, you're getting planes that weren't necessarily involved. A lot of Dunkirk might have been with hurricanes on the British side and uh, not necessarily as many spits. Uh, the 109s in the film, I think, are Spanish variants of some sort. But, uh, you know, again, that's that's nitpicking, really. It doesn't take away from the film. And honestly, you can't expect them to sacrifice very rare warbirds uh, for the sake of a movie. So, yeah, I think that about covers it. I think the only other thing... I recall is after I saw it, my friend had mentioned, you know, there was very little dialogue and in a way the movie could have just been the soundtrack and the sound effects and it still would have been fine. And that's true. Not that the dialogue was bad, um, but you could have just watched the movie without anybody saying a single thing and it would have worked as well. And I think that goes to show how well it was shot and how everything pieced together. Excellent film. Go see it. So, moving right along, uh, I think I'll go into some DCS. Why am I playing so much of it? What happened? How did I get here? I think, funny enough, it began with uh, Rising Storm 2 Vietnam. Huh? How? Well, I was playing that. Good game, by the way. Highly recommend it. And there's helicopters in it. And I wanted to fly. But then I realized that the game didn't come out with joystick support. Maybe they've added it by now. I know it's something that's on their list of things to do, along with potentially track IR support, but I was like, man, it's kind of weird, this realistic Vietnam game without joystick support for the helos. I mean, even Battlefield 2 back in the day had joystick support for the aircraft. Um, so I was kind of disappointed with that, and I started looking for a Huey sim who has the best one out there. DCS does. And I was like, oh, but it's DCS, and it's flying a helicopter. I'll never be able to figure that out. I mean, flying a helicopter is supposedly more difficult than flying any kind of plane. And so I was like, I don't know if I have the patience for that. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. One thing led to the next. I'm installing IL-2, because I'm like, well, I feel like flying now. And so I install that, because that's the only sim I have. And so I install that, and I get interested in it, start enjoying myself, start taking it a little bit more seriously. And then I end up looking at DCS 1.5 because I think, once again, somebody in my live stream chat mentioned it. I find myself a few days later downloading that, playing around with the TF-51. I'm hooked, and here I am, addicted to this flight simulator that I never thought in a million years that I'd be playing. And addicted to the things that I never thought that I would be addicted to, like starting up the plane. I used to joke about it all the time. I used to say, oh, I don't want to play that. I don't want to spend five hours trying to turn on my aircraft. I love trying to turn on my aircraft, especially when you get a new module 
and you're learning for the first time how to turn it on. It's my favorite thing to do now. It sounds so silly and stupid maybe, but I love it. I love how interactive these cockpits are. Um, not all of them are. Like some of the older Flaming Cliff stuff uh, isn't as interactive as the, as the newer DCS modules, but the ones that have the fully clickable cockpits where you can press all the buttons and spin the dials and knobs and levers and all that stuff. I love it. It's great. I mean, I'll probably do another video where I focus on the Spitfire a little bit more. Trying to start this thing up, it's like operating something in Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. It's it's kind of hilarious and very British. Um, by far the most difficult plane to fly in, in DCS. Uh, I haven't flown a helicopter yet, but I can only imagine that outside of helicopters, the Spitfire is the most challenging aircraft in, in the entire series. I mean, my opinion, of course, um, but it, it seems that way. I'll tell you one thing, though. After you fly the Spit, everything else is easy. The Mustang, the BF-109, the Focke Wolf 190, easy peasy compared to this thing. It's a monster. Um, once you get it in the air, though, it's it's pretty nice the way it turns and handles. It's not bad, but oh my goodness. Trying to get into the air, the taxiing, the takeoff, landings. Let's not talk about landings in general. <laughs> I need to work on that even in the Mustang, but uh, I'm getting better. There is progress. It's just very limited. Um, but yeah, here I am, addicted to this. I am interested in jets. People always ask me about that. Do you want to play with modern jets? I do have the F-86F Sabre, obviously Korean War era, 1950s, um, because I thought that that would be a smoother transition out of tail draggers into a jet of some sort. Um, I do want to eventually try out the uh, A-10C. Uh, there is some interest in the Hornet module that's not out yet. There's interest in Harrier and all that stuff. Um, I might even try, I don't know, I know it's part of the Flaming Cliff series, but I've always loved the F-15. Uh, it doesn't have a fully interactive cockpit, I don't think, but I might even consider messing around with that too, just because it's an F-15 and it's the only one that they've got as a module. Um, but yeah, I, I do have interest in jets if you're curious about that. Um, I do have interest in actually engaging in combat. I've done some multiplayer battles in the Mustang. I actually did hit a target once. I didn't kill him, but I hit him, and that was kind of exciting. And you see, I think that's the thing about DCS. The little things in this sim are the things that excite me the most because it feels like such a big deal when you actually achieve that aspect, when you actually start the plane for the first time. It's an achievement for me. When you hit somebody in multiplayer for the first time. That's an achievement because you did it in one of the world's most challenging flight simulators. And I think that's what people sometimes don't understand when making comparisons to this and something else, right? Like IL-2, for example, is built to be a, a different type of gameplay experience. It's more of a complete package in terms of nation versus nation combat. You get an assortment of planes and some maps but each plane isn't as detailed as what you find in DCS, which is built to be a hardcore simulator that's bringing the plane into your living room. If you want to learn how to start up a real Spitfire, or a Mustang, or a 109, or 190, or a Sabre Jet, or a Warthog, you play DCS. I've been watching videos by Kermit Weeks. He's the founder of Fantasy of Flight in Florida, and... Uh, he brings a GoPro into the cockpit of his Warbirds. Uh, his recent video was of the P-51D Mustang. And I recognize everything. He does the startup procedure. He does it in a different order than I do in, in DCS. But I'm like, wow, I could, I could start a Mustang. Pretty sure. I'd want to do it under supervision, as I've mentioned in the past. But I recognize all the, all the switches and the dials and the procedure. And that, to me, is the coolest thing ever. And you don't get that in other titles. And and that's the point, really. This isn't a game, it's an experience. I think, who is it that says, one of my viewers, or mods, MP or Von Kickass, one of those guys that says that DCS is not a game, it's a life choice. <laughs> I agree, because you start investing in it. You buy one module, you want another, and then you get a, a flight stick, but then you need the, the throttle, and maybe you end up with rudder pedals or something. 
you just get so into it. And, uh, you know, I hope it's something that lasts me for a long time because obviously I'm in and out of video games and things like that. And, um, you know, I get tired or burnt out. And so I can never promise to play one thing forever. But I can tell you right now I'm enjoying the learning experience. It kind of reminds me of the good old days of PC gaming that I grew up with where PCs were known to have these very intricate and detailed simulators. The, you know, the the Falcon style games that come with the war and peace style manual, um, you know, playing the old Sierra point and click games, space quest and King's quest and all that stuff. And games that were just more challenging and required, you know, thought process and that had a learning curve. And I kind of like that and I miss it. And going back to DCS, I feel like, Oh yeah, this is why I own a PC. You know, it's not dumbed down in any way. I made a joke the other day. Uh, when I was in my Mustang, because at the front, where the gun sight is, uh, it has a label that says no handhold. And somebody was asking in the chat, what, is, what does that mean? Why does it say, no? what happens if you put your hand there? And I was like, oh, that's just DCS telling you that it doesn't hold your hand. <laughs> um, you know, there's obviously other reasons for that. The fragility of the, uh, the gun sight mechanism and, and whatnot. You don't want to put your hand there and, and weigh it down and break it, snap it off or whatever. But... Um, that was kind of my play on why it's there, right? Because back in the day with PC games, you actually had to take the time to learn and read and study up a little bit. And some people are afraid of that. And let me tell you something right now. I never thought in a million years I would be playing this, let alone a flight simulator in general, because, again, I'm more of a, a ground combat guy. Um, if I can do it, you can do it. Trust me. Because... For me, I'm always honest about this, I feel that it takes me a little longer to learn things than, than most people. Granted, I think I have some inherent abilities that make me better at games than a lot of other people. I think I'm more situationally aware when it comes to a lot of these scenarios, but I think that if I can start to learn these systems, if I can start to learn a, a procedure, a startup procedure, um, if I can figure out what a gauge means or how to use the plane in some way, if I can take off in a tail dragger, if I can once in a while land, once in a while, not as much in the spit, but you know, if I can pull these things off, then you can too. And so if you've ever thought about trying this out, give it a shot. Get into DCS 1.5. It's the free client. It comes with two planes. Try them out. Don't buy anything right away. Just take a look at it and see if you can enjoy yourself. Um, there's also game modes within the title that allow you to dumb things down a little bit if you don't really want to deal with uh, the technical side of things. Uh, there's quick start procedures that you can do a key combo for to figure out. Although the funny thing is, even though I tell you that, I would suggest trying to learn the startup procedures on your own. They're just so much fun. Oh, by the way, yes, there is a reason that you're headless. Uh, for the pilot model, if you're wondering. It has a lot to do with, I think, uh, avoiding interference when using track IR and VR. Um, at least that's what I know it to be. Because I remember when Star Citizen added, or excuse me, when they changed something with the player model, the head model interfered with track IR and it broke something. I don't know if they fixed it by now. They may have. Anyways, just shooting some guns there, because why not? Um... Yeah, I can't wait to start getting a little bit more into the combat. I would say that that's kind of the weak point of DCS right now. And they're working on the damage model. They're working on, uh, I think, their server stuff. I think right now it's dual core at most. But I think they're working on getting some more multi-threading or multi-core support in the future, hopefully. Because uh, I really want to see the multiplayer aspects of this game take off. And, you know, even calling it a game, I try not to do that, because it really isn't. It's it's a simulator, but even then, it's much more than that. It's almost in its own category. A lot of people just call it a study sim, and I guess that would be true, especially considering all the fully interactive uh, aircraft that allow you to manipulate all the buttons, dials, and levers, and whatnot. But uh, anyways, let's go ahead and talk about something else. Channel status, Twitch and YouTube in general. Um... What's going on here? Where are we going? Well, seems like the vision of the YouTube channel changes every few months. And it's simply because a lot of times I'm testing things out. And because I'm simply just into way too many games and 
uh, ways of sharing those gameplay experiences. Uh, I was doing some single player playthroughs. We did an entire playthrough of Uncharted 4, uh, Last of Us Remastered, Titanfall 2, and Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, zero regrets. Loved every minute of doing those things. The problem is they're not popular. And they take up a lot of time. And considering that this is my career, it's kind of like going to work and not making enough per hour. Uh, this is especially true when talking about the Horizon Zero Dawn playthrough because that was an open world RPG. I had to do a lot of editing. A ton of editing, more editing than I've ever had to do on a series. And one video would sometimes take up three to five hours of editing time. And then I'd have to wait for YouTube to process it and this and that. And it was a whole ordeal. Now, I don't regret it. I learned a lot from it. But when some of the later videos only end up with 2,000 views, that's bad for business. And the problem with single player playthroughs or let's plays is that everybody does them and there's always somebody to do one before you and a saying that I came up with this year is that it's okay to be the worst as long as you're the first that's pretty much the YouTube and Twitch motto now so considering Horizon Zero Dawn some people even had it a week or two in advance they got press copies before me they beat the game they unlisted the videos once the game came out popped them up and already they have a, a let's play before everybody else. Uh, there's no competing with that. Now granted, do I think that my videos are better in some ways? Do I think they're higher quality? Yeah, I'm not gonna be humble about it. I do think they're really good. <laughs> um, I think this, the, the experience is kept cinematic. I don't talk over the dialogue. I upload high resolution, high bit rate, uh, video and audio. I try to do the game justice. I focus on the characters in the story and not myself. Um, the game is the centerpiece and the star, not me. I'm just the cameraman and the stunt man. And I love doing it. I love sharing those experiences. I would regret playing a single player game and not sharing it at this point. The thing is, when you take so much time to edit a video, people tend to leave your channel and go somewhere else to go get the conclusion because human beings are impatient. And so there was even people telling me, oh, you know, sorry, but I had to find out what happened next. So I went and watched it somewhere else. But hey, I came back to watch yours. Somebody told me that. But then I wondered when somebody told me that about other people and how many people started with me, left and never came back because you know, it would take me a while to, to finish the edit, and I didn't want to burn myself out, and so I tried to do it right, but in doing so, I lost viewership. And so, if we look at Horizon, the first video released is somewhere around 10,000 views, which is peanuts. You know, we're not supposed to disclose what we make on YouTube, but I can tell you safely that that is a criminal amount to be paid for a few hours of editing you can't make a living off of that and so therefore I'm not sure if I can do playthroughs of open world games like that again because it's just too much work and I'm very stubborn about how I present things to the point where I don't see myself changing the format I can't just play it and upload it and not edit it it has to be edited it has to look good it has to sound good it has to present the story in a way befitting of entertainment with standards. Otherwise, what's the point of this YouTube channel? I'm not going to lower myself to the level of these other channels. Um, this isn't fast food. And I'm not saying I'm the best channel on the planet, that I make the best content ever. But considering the other playthroughs I've seen after beating my games, uh, uh, yeah, they're pretty bad. Um, and I think it just comes down to people wanting to get things out first because it's all about exclusivity. If you have something first, you win. And um, yeah, I don't see myself ever lowering myself to that. And uh, so if I continue to do playthroughs, they may be more linear games. Like Uncharted, Last of Us, Titanfall were more linear. Um, Uncharted 4 was a little bit more open, but it was still following a, a storyline and, and taking you down a certain path. 
to where there wasn't a ton of editing. It was more manageable. By the way, incoming horrendous landing. Terrible, bad landing. I apologize to Spitfire owners everywhere, but it's much more difficult than it looks. But anyways, yeah, the, the playthroughs, we'll see how that goes. I don't want to make too many promises. Oh, this landing is worse than I even remember. Oh my goodness. Somehow I didn't break anything though. So actually it's a really good landing. I don't know how I didn't make the plane explode. I'll show you here in a another camera view that I didn't actually smash anything to bits. I'm not on fire. That's, that's always a plus. But yeah. So uh, now that I've been thoroughly distracted by that, again, we'll see how the single player stuff goes. I don't want to make too many promises. I also don't want to promise to continue streaming single player playthroughs because that often adds to the workload. There's more discussion and chat that I have to edit out. So I think future playthroughs, more linear games, non live streamed seems like the weapon of choice. I think I'm out of material, guys. Um, I'm sure I'll bring some of these subjects up again in the future. Maybe another strafing run. I'll talk about it further because I'm not 100% on which direction I want to go with those aspects of the channel. But for right now, yeah, I'm done here. All right, guys, I really hope that you've enjoyed this episode of the strafing run. I hate asking, but it seems like that's what you have to do here. If you've enjoyed this video, please leave me with a like and uh, perhaps a comment if you have any questions or concerns. With that said, thank you so much for joining me. I'll see you on the next one.